Hey friends, and welcome to the Happy Hour Jamie Ivy podcast. I'm your host, Jamie, and I'm so excited you're here. Every week I invite a girlfriend to join me on the show and we chat about the big things in life, the little things in life, and everything in between. Before we get to our guest today, I want to thank one of our partners for today's show, and that is EM Jewelry Design. After graduating with a BFA in jewelry design and metalsmithing from Texas Tech University, Ellen Moat found a job working for a jewelry designer in Portland, Oregon. However, when her husband's job led them to Waco, Texas, it became clear to her that if she wanted to continue working in the jewelry industry, she was going to have to do it on her own. Ellen started EM Jewelry Design in the fall of 2015 and has since launched her original pieces on her website, emjewelrydesign.com, and has been featured in the Magnolia Journal as one of Joanna Gaines' gift guide picks. Ellen's heart behind her work is to encourage, inspire, and empower women to pursue their own God-given passions. Right now, Ellen has a deal for all of our Happy Hour listeners. You can save 10% on your next purchase with the code Happy Hour. Guys, you're listening to episode number 130, and today my guest is Joy Egrich reed Joy was such a fun guest. We talk about why some of us need to take an improv class. Never even thought about that, but I'm going to add it to my bucket list, maybe. She told some funny, crazy stories from her wedding. Literally, if you're getting married, you're going to want to take on some of her things that she did. Why she wanted to start a speaking agency, plus what she used to fear while she was on swim team. I even asked her my most favorite question to ask around the dinner table with new friends. And it was quite hilarious to see her process and how she got to her answer. If you want to send us a message about anything while you're listening, we'd love to hear from you. I am at Jamie underscore Ivy on Twitter and Joy is at Joy Agrich. Guys, also, if you've been listening to the show for a while, but you have never subscribed, subscribing to the show in iTunes or wherever you get your podcast is a great way to make sure that every week when we release a new show, it always comes to you however you listen to your show. It's super easy. Go to jamieivy.com slash iTunes. Just hit subscribe and every week the show comes into your little podcast player, however you listen. Guys, yesterday I turned in my book. I cannot even believe it. Uh, I turned in the very first manuscript and lots more will happen before it ever hits a shelf. Um, I'd love to tell you all about that process because it is a process. But today I'm doing all the things I've been putting off for months. I'm having lunch with friends. I'm getting my car washed. I'm going to a bookstore and I'm going to peruse around as long as I want until a book jumps out at me. And then I'm going to go home. I'm going to read a little and nap a little. And I'm not going to do one ounce of work today. That is my March 1st. Uh, But hold on. March 2nd brings back new work. So there's that. Guys, thanks for cheering me on in that journey. And here is my conversation with Joy. Hey, Joy, welcome to the happy hour. Oh, thank you for having me. It's so fun to have you on the show because um, you've never been a guest and you've been on my list for a long time. Um, and one of your closest friends, Liz, was on a while ago. So I feel I like know. you like have she to show up. She nudged you. Yeah, she <laughs> nudged it um, forever ago. She was number 75. And, and aren't you over like 100 now? You're 130. That is amazing. I know. How, how many years have you been doing this? In May will be three years. Okay. Impressive. That, I mean, because that's the kind of thing I feel like people will be like, oh, I have an idea for a podcast. And you're like, oh, tell me about it. And you're like, mm, that's about five episodes worth of content. <laughs> <laughs> keep going. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And when I started it, which I know that you're a dreamer and start things and love to like see vision. When yeah. I started it, I can honestly say it was just like this hobby thing for me. Like, oh, that'll be fun. And I put a show out like maybe on a Tuesday and then maybe next Thursday. It was just it was just a hobby. Yeah. Um, and then when I decided like, OK, I think I'm going to do this for a job, then, yeah. you know, I tell people, they're like, oh, I think I want to do a show. I'm like, well, if you want it to be a job, doesn't matter what's going on. You have to put a show out every week. So yeah, buckle up. So you, so at first you were not consistent in your release dates. It was just kind of no. like whatever happened. Yeah. Okay. And I, I think I wanted to be consistent, but if I was supposed to have a show out the next day and I did everything on my own at that time, like everything, yeah. edit everything. Yeah. And if there's supposed to be a show out, but my husband, Aaron was like, Hey, you want to watch TV tonight? I'm like, yeah, of course. I'd rather do that than work yeah. on this. So <laughs> This can wait. <laughs> so yeah, it yeah. was so inconsistent. Did you teach yourself all the like technology and how to, you know, do a podcast or did you have someone come in and help no, you? I taught myself everything. Uh, and, do you like doing that? Like, are no, you kind of like a figure awful. outer? Well, I don't know. This is probably the first big thing I've ever done like that. And so I did all the editing in GarageBand, which I hated that part of the show. That's why I put it off. I think that's why it was so inconsistent because to sit down and edit something for an hour I hated it and I wasn't yeah. that good at it. Sometimes my husband would listen. He used to listen a lot more than he does now. And he would point out like 
because he's a music guy. Like he has an ear for that. And yeah. he'd be like, I think you could have edited this better. And I really was like, I don't care. Like, yeah, I don't care, which is bad. You're like, I want to have the conversation. Exactly. I don't want to do the editing. <laughs> yes. But now I did it all. That's amazing. I know. Which people are like, hey, I want to do a show. I want to hire people out. I'm like, okay, it takes money. And yeah. I think people should learn how to do it at first. Yeah. Yeah. I think it gives you an appreciation and an understanding for the behind the scenes. It does. Yeah. So that, and and you can learn like me that you really don't know how to do it. <laughs> right. And that you don't like doing it either. Like yeah, that was the yeah. first thing I knew I wanted to outsource. And so Yeah. It's been great. Well, yeah. congratulations on how far you've come. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Are you forgive me for not knowing this. Are you still doing stuff with relevant podcasts? No. Okay. Uh, I wrapped that up uh kind of in the fall. So um, but now I'm full time doing punchline speakers. And which is my new speaking agency and my husband and I are moving to France. And so there's a few things kind of going on in the mix that I just need to devote my focus to. <laughs> so many things. So yes. many things. Okay. So I listen to relevant in like stretches, if that makes sense. Yeah. So when I go on a road trip, I literally will listen to like five of them. <laughs> and I love to listen to it with my husband because we die laughing because they're so hilarious, Joy. I mean, so hilarious. Did you have yeah. so much fun working with those guys? Yes, it was really fun. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons, actually, when I first, uh, when I used to do Love and Respect Now, which was a 18 to 35 year old kind of relationship thing, um, I was starting to, I wanted to do a podcast. So I had recorded like 10 different interviews and, and it was, it was like the technology piece. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. And, and someone connected me with Cameron, uh, who started Relevant. And he was like, you know what, if you don't like the technology piece and you don't, you know, it's kind of de-energizing to you, why don't you come on and, and work with us? Us. And what I loved about it, I really love interviewing like you do. Mm -hmm. But what I loved about that collaboration was that um, it really played to I, I've taken improv classes here in Portland, and I love improv. And I think collaborative comedy is just my favorite. So it was really fun working with those guys because they're hilarious. And just getting to kind of like play off of it's setting setting uh, Jesse up for a story <laughs> is my <laughs> favorite thing to do. It's like just pitching him a softball and then just know he's about to knock it out of the park. Exactly. I can I can start something with like, Jesse, I picture you. And then like, wherever that goes, it's going to be beautiful. <laughs> you know, I never I knew that you had told me that you liked improv and I never thought about it with that podcast. But that's exactly what it is. It's like getting yeah. a bunch of people in a room, get them a microphone, and then just let them crack each other up. Yeah. And then we They're get really to listen. <laughs> um, I remember right. a couple of, probably about a year ago, one of the guys from Relevant sent me uh, a message on Twitter telling me that like I was doing a good job with my podcast. And it was one of the biggest compliments I ever got in my entire life. I was like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. That was so nice. Um, I so love it. I have so much respect for those guys over there. Um, yeah, fun, fun stuff. Um, okay. Improv, I've never, ever met anyone in my life that loves, I, I take that back. I do know a friend who does, who loves it and does it. Where did this come from in your life? You know, I think I had several friends tell me I should take some classes, just some introductory classes, which I would now recommend to everybody. And when people are like, oh no, I'm not funny or I don't, it's, it's not even about being funny. Like I did it because I was public speaking and I did a lot of Q and A at the end of a talk that I would give. And mm -hmm. I wanted just to be quicker on my feet and just feel a freedom to not know what was coming next. So I took an introductory class and there's it, introductory improv classes are a tons of people who are like, I made a new year's resolution to do something. And it's so outside of the box for me. <laughs> and they're like so, dying on the inside. Yes. He, yeah. So it's not until you get to the more advanced classes where it's people who want to be actors or, you know, pursue something in that comedic role. But the foundations of improv were so life-changing for me um, that then I got addicted to it and I've been I've taken for several years and I'm actually looking for um, improv classes when we were moving to Paris and so I want to take it there <laughs> well I never even thought that it would be beneficial to someone like me who does just what you said speaks and does Q&A and stuff but I don't want to be a stand-up comedian Totally. Well, and uh, one of the demographics that really benefits from improv classes, like one of my teachers specifically goes into hospitals and doctor's offices and teaches medical professionals improv principles because you've got people who are super smart and know how to cut someone open, but have terrible bedside manner and don't so know true. how to 
how to read body language of people or lighten a situation in an appropriate manner. Um, so yeah, and they even um, they've done studies on kids with autism or kids who have grown up in really traumatic inner city communities, how the principles of improv really help heal them. So I'm a huge fan. As you wow. Can <laughs> yeah. How many people after listening to this are going to be signing up for improv classes? I know. Everybody do it. New Year's resolution there come in go. March. March 1st, baby. <laughs> I bet they have it here in Austin. They have to. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I want to, I'm trying to think if I even have gone to see, usually when I'm in a city, I check and see if they have any improv shows going, but I'm for sure. Any of your comedy clubs will have an improv night. Okay. Joy, I haven't been to a comedy club since I was in college. Hey, get back in it. That's a date night. That's what you got to do. <gasps> I could spice <laughs> things up and take air night to a, to a comedy club. Totally. I'm putting yeah. it down on my list of things to do. Now, you have to brace yourself because one of the things, especially if you're seeing an improv troupe that maybe is like, you know, like first year students performing, mm. like until, <laughs> until improvisers get like improvising can be so terrifying to watch because you really I mean, you literally don't know. It's totally made up. Um, and a lot of people can if they don't like know the skill, like people default to being dirty. So that's oh. just a heads up if a bunch of people are like. I'm going to go to see the show that Joy recommended. It's like, I, 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 disclaimer, I can't promise you that. Disclaimer, it's be disclaimer. Clear. You know, it's interesting. Do you listen to um, the podcast, Sam Jones, uh, um, off camera, off no. camera with Sam Jones? Okay, you've got to listen to it because it's, it's one of my favorite podcasts to listen to. First of all, he interviews, most of them are, well, all of them actually are in the acting world, movie stars, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and he recently had Elijah Wood on. And right. he does a lot of indie films now after The Hobbit stuff all went crazy. Isn't that what he was in, okay. The Hobbit? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, or all the Lord of the Rings All the stuff. Lord of the Rings. Yes, that's yeah. what it was. And so he does a lot of indie films because he's really into just the act of creating art, which I loved listening to him talk about it. But, Joy, you'll appreciate this because he was sharing a story about a movie where he was having to do improv. And so mm -hmm. it was a script. So he was reading a script, right? But he's doing improv. But to get into the character, he went and did a, an act at a comedy club. So like the night before, him and his buddy created this five minute, I guess, whatever you call bit. it. Yeah, bit or bit? something. Yeah, Ooh, I feel yeah. so. Yeah, five minute bit. <laughs> and then he went to the comedy club and and did it. Can you imagine if you were in the audience or like the next performer? Yeah, seriously. Elijah Wood. I know. Well, that's the cool. I mean, like in places like L.A. and New York, I mean, I guess that's kind of the thing of where a lot of comedians and actors, like you're saying, go to these small clubs to work out their material. But they'll call the club like an hour before and be like, hey, I'm going to be here. So like when I was in New York, I went to UCB, which is Upright Citizens Brigade. And that's all. Uh, well, it's improvised material and sketch comedy. And you don't know always who's going to perform. And I sat down one night and it was A.D. Bryant uh -huh. from SNL uh -huh. and um, Amy Poehler. <laughs> Stop. So, yeah. And I'm talking a room of like 50 of us. So I like lost my mind. <laughs> were they hilarious? Like I would imagine. Oh. oh, yeah. I mean, the two of them together, too, were just out of this world. Yeah, it was amazing. OK, so do you so. ever dream of doing something like that? Um, no, I, I mean, I do not have the skill to be, I mean, comedians that are at that level are so quick, so smart, and you would have to dedicate your life to doing it. And that's, that's not necessarily where I'm headed, but I have such an admiration for comedians and I just want to continue taking classes just because I think they, they help so much. And I love the comedy community. Like I don't, I wasn't ever really involved in theater in high school or even team sports, but man, the like theater community, they're just wonderful people. And everybody's always so supportive. Like, yay, you tried. <laughs> uh, so I live in Portland, Oregon, and I just love the people that I've met through the improv community. Okay, that's awesome. And it's interesting for us that aren't a part of this and like really don't even have any knowledge about it. You, we would tend to think that comedians are just funny people, so they just stand up and say funny things. But they work no. at a craft. Yeah, yeah. I think one one of the powerful things that one of my uh, improv teachers said was the best improvisers 
aren't the people that are saying the line that makes everybody laugh the most. They're generally the people like, because of the collaborative nature of improv, they're the people that are helping set people up. Mm. They're thinking so strategically about the information that's been given that they're not trying to be the star of the show, but they're just setting people up for a win. So Mm. it really, once you've studied it, it's really interesting to watch people and you're like, wow, that person's the most skilled, but they might not be the person getting the biggest laugh. So Mm. yeah, it's, it's interesting. So interesting. So interesting. Yeah. Okay, Joy, how long have you been married? Uh, one year as of February 20th. Happy anniversary. Thank you so much. We okay. are very excited. Okay, I um, have loved following you on social media. I loved seeing your wedding pictures. You, you look, It looked to me as though you had one of the most, like people would fly across the country to come to your wedding because it was <laughs> that much fun. It really like it was kind of like we had a wedding high and then crash. Like <laughs> we're like, can't how can we do that again? I mean, I feel like a lot of people think that about their wedding just because it's probably the one time in your life outside of your funeral where like everyone that loves you is mm-hmm. gonna come and gather into one room. So it's just, I mean, it's just mind blowing to experience that kind of love. But then yeah, I mean, definitely my uh performance love played a role <laughs> into the because wedding. you put on a party for people and not just a party. Like, (laughs) what are some crazy things that you did at your wedding that are out of the box? Oh, man. Well, we, um, so I'd seen some of those videos, you know, where people do crazy, like, dances Uh together for Uh their first dance. Well, um, we didn't have time to choreograph something necessarily, but one of the things that we get is that my husband, when he doesn't have a beard, he, his bizarro person is, is, um, uh, who's the guy from Dirty Dancing? Patrick Swayze? Patrick Swayze, yeah. Oh. He really he really does kind of look like him, which is weird because I'm not really attracted to Patrick Swayze. But, um, do you have a bizarro? Like, do you have someone that people think you look like? I don't think so. Um, my husband, people have said, looks like Ron Howard, which I'm definitely not attracted to Ron Howard. Yeah. But I'm very attracted to my husband. Yeah, um, isn't that weird? Yeah, it's weird. Okay, so yes. So we did, for our wedding, we did a video invite because the idea of like sending out all these paper invites was overwhelming to me. So I was like, let's just make a video. And in that, at the very end, we did this thing where we reenacted the um, Dirty Dancing lift, you know, where yes. Patrick Swayze. Yes, time in my from, life. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes. And it was like a total flop. Like he like, we, I went for the lift and then I went into like a sack of potatoes over his, his shoulder. And so the whole thing was like, we're going to practice. We're going to get better. This is going to be the best dance party ever and whatever. So then for our first dance, we come out and we do, um, we dance to like an, a slow Al Green song. Uh-huh. And then Eddie and Jesse from the Relevant Podcast were our MCs. And so it was kind of set up that they would like interrupt us in the middle of our dance and be like, like, whoa, wait, wait, guys, like, this is a great first dance, but wasn't the whole thing that you were going to do the dirty dancing lift, you know? And then, so then we like back up and the dirty dancing song starts playing. And, um, and I'm in this big, heavy wedding dress. And my husband is like just an average size. Like there's, it, there's no way that he could have lifted <laughs> me in that dress above his head. So I'm like running towards him and there's like 300 people at our wedding and they're all going, oh my goodness. What's, okay, what's but this was happen? planned, right? Like you knew this oh, was yeah. going to go down. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So like two nights before the wedding, we had a really quick rehearsal <laughs> with all of our um, wedding party. And so I like do this slow-mo run to him and he's got his hands out and everybody's like, what's going to happen? But we had, we had choreographed that like at the last second, the groomsmen would step in on either side and someone had taught us how to like go into this lift. So all of the guys at the last second lifted me and then like <laughs> watched oh, me around Oh my stage. gosh. In effect, we did the lift. You did um, it. Is this on video somewhere that we can all see this? Yeah, actually, um, we had a friend that was filming our wedding and uh, he's just taken a little while to edit the video, but there, but it should be coming soon. So <laughs> well, we're I, all going to be anxiously awaiting just so you know. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So there was some other choreography, but it was overall, I think uh, my favorite thing was that we, and it may, maybe not for the guests, but 
I heard about in Europe, some cultures, like I heard about this German wedding. So maybe it's just the Germans, um, where all of their friends like did skits and toasts for them. And the party lasted to like four o'clock in the morning. Oh my God. And I was like, Oh my goodness, I would love nothing more than like tons of my friends to do skits <laughs> and like make fun. <laughs> of Basically like you turn your wedding into a roast. It is. It's so, you're yeah. very, you're the best roast of your life. Yes. Yeah. So we did some of that as well. And it was just, it really was a blast and I want to do it all over again. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well then maybe, um, you'll have to do like this renew your vow thing and do another party in like five years. I know we, we really would love to do that. So, oh my gosh, the video invite people are, that is so brilliant. You know how much money yeah. you saved joy. <laughs> Oh, yes, I know. It was, yeah. And then that money went towards a choreographer helping us figure <laughs> yeah. out how to do a fake lift. But yes, um, yeah. And it was so much more fun. I mean, if you have a friend, if someone's getting married and you have a friend to like film something for you, it's so much easier to get people's email addresses. Oh, it's <laughs> just their, the yeah. best. And what an email, what a fun email to get anyways. Uh, yeah, was- Dirty Dancing. This goes under the list of movies that I watched forever as a child and had no clue about so many of the things that were happening in this movie. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to watch it when I was younger, so, but oh. I, I, yeah. This so goes along with do. Dirty Dancing, Grease, Pretty Woman. I mean, all of those movies I watched as a child, and I look back now and I think, wow, yeah. what was happening in my world? And, and and I didn't, I wasn't allowed to watch 80s movies, and I've watched them subsequently when I'm old, when I was older, and I was like, Wow, these, I mean, the 80s genre was really interesting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the rating system was different. So uh, wait till oh. you have kids and you're like, oh, I'm going to introduce you to all the movies of my childhood. Well, yeah. our oldest is 13 and our youngest is nine. And so every once in a while I'll be like, oh, let's watch this movie. It's from when I was a kid. And it starts and I'm like, oh, we can't watch this. What's happening here? I mean, yeah. yeah. And my husband wait, let so- the kids watch Big recently. Oh, yeah. It's rated That's PG. Weird. But I think they dropped the F bomb and I think there's like this inappropriate thing that happens at one time. Yeah, because she it's like an older woman with a younger guy. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. Uh huh. It's PG. That's amazing. So the so our rating system has gotten more well, stringent. Th- someone can correct us because they will when they listen. But I I, <laughs> I thought I had heard that there was no PG thirteen at one point. That it was like uh, G P G R. Interesting. So there's a big jump there between the PG-13. Yeah. yeah. So I guess I should show my kids G movies from the 80s, basically, is yeah. what I'm looking at here. <laughs> Disney, you know, like yeah. Beauty and the Beast, guys. That's what we have working with. Uh, but yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Crazy cool. old movies. Crazy old movies. Um, yeah. Okay. You just started a new company. I did. Which, yes. Kudos to you because I love it when I hear people like, yeah, I just, I I saw a need. I think I can do this. And so I just started a company. That's what you just did. (laughs) Yes. Now we all know this didn't just happen overnight, but. And now I'm going, what did I just do? (laughs) (laughs) But why did you want to start a speaking representation company? Is that what you call yourself? Yeah. A speaking agency. Agency. Yeah. Yeah, That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. Um, well, a couple reasons. One, I think my whole life I have, I grew up as a pastor's daughter. And so I always was watching people on stage. And I think I've just always been intrigued with really, uh, good communicators Mm -hmm. and, and a varying degree. I mean, I think there's some people who can stand behind a podium and read a lecture and be an incredible communicator because that's their style and that works for them. And that engages the audience versus someone who's like running all over the stage and singing and dancing. Mm -hmm. I think I have an appreciation for a wide variety of things. So, um, So I've always loved it. And then I've been a public speaker myself. And so I've seen kind of the behind the scenes and how much prep it takes to get ready for a talk, as I'm sure you know. And, um, and then the last couple of years, um, I have represented my father, um, and booked all of his speaking engagements as well as I've been his literary agent. So I found that I really like contracts and I like, um, being the middle person. I've also run events. So I'm like, okay, I know the event side of things. Mm -hmm. I know the contract side of things and I know the speaking side of things. Um, and so out of that, like several friends who knew I was representing my father asked if I would represent them. And I kept saying, well, no, I I would just have to start a whole agency. And no, I'd have to start a whole agency. <laughs> then finally, I was like, I'm a 34 year old woman, and I have experience. I can start a whole agency. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I've brought on some other people who are incredible and have strengths in areas that I don't have strengths. And um, I'm really excited. We just launched a couple of weeks ago. And um, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited about hopefully being really customer service oriented for both the speaker and the host and making everybody happy. Mm. Uh, customer so. service oriented. I love that. Um, and I think it's cool that you have been on all sides because I feel like sometimes when stuff gets lost in the middle is when someone doesn't understand what it's like to be the other person. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I like, I always want to have like a, whenever I go speak at different places, I always want to create this document, but I never will. I'll just email it to you, but you already know this of the awesome things that people do. And then the terrible things that people do. Yes. But Can no you tell me if you, <laughs> no one's your trying thing? to be mean, like nobody, you know what never. I mean? No, no. Um, but it's like when people, this sounds so dumb and it sounds like I think I'm something special, but when you come into a place and you don't know anybody there and you're backstage and you're waiting to go on to speak, um, and there's a thin line. This is what's a hard because there's a thin line between like overbearing and then not making <laughs> them feel alone. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. So I don't like sitting back there in a room mm -hmm. where the other people are around me and no one even acts like I'm sitting there. Yeah. But I also don't want someone beside me the whole time wanting to ask about my life. Does that make sense? Totally. Totally. And that's where I think part of, you know, the contract slash writer that we do is customized for each speaker because there are some speakers who literally they're like, I have to get in my zone. I have to, I have to like be totally alone. Mm -hmm. So the events that you're at where you're totally alone is probably based off of their experience of going so-and-so wanted spoke to be last, alone. Yeah. Wanted to be alone. And then for someone who's sitting there, you know, asking your life story, they're just a big fan of you and they have no social boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> So it is, it is one of those things where it is a fine line and it's so different for each speaker. And, um, but that's what we're hoping to help set up both parties for success, <laughs> man. And it is, it is whenever I travel and, and, you know, people have to realize that when someone's coming to your event or coming to your church or whatever, they more than likely left. Well, they left their home. That's for sure. Obviously. Um, yeah. but a lot of them left their families, you know? And so yeah. whenever people are super appreciative of that, it makes me feel like, man, I love what I do anyway. It's like, I love telling people about Jesus. I love speaking about his truths, but I mm -hmm. really also love that it's recognized that, that it is a cost for me, you know, totally. to leave my totally. people. I have to leave my people to come to you and I love it. I, I love my job, um, yeah. but I like it when it's acknowledged, if that makes sense. Does that make me totally. selfish? No, not at all. That's, we have like a pretty detailed speaker questionnaire, which some of our speakers love and others don't. But one of the questions is, if it was up to you, how many nights a month would you be on the road speaking? Mm -hmm. And then the follow-up question is, does this align with your family? Um, because we do really want to be protective of people. Like we want to get an idea. Are, are they just speaking because it helps their book or something like mm -hmm. that? Or are they really, are they speaking because they love to speak and they would, they would want to be on the road every single night, but they're also respectful and realistic about their family. And so therefore they can only travel twice a month right. or something like that. Yeah. Then we, we will be the gatekeepers for them in that. And then along the ministry lines, as I'm sure you've experienced it, it, it is this thing that where I'm trying to help some of the hosts, um, understand the value of someone's time and that it is taking them away from their family because it, it's it's this hard line with ministry um, where people think that you should just do ministry missionally <laughs> and that, free. That, <laughs> for free. <laughs> and so I try to be gracious in that having worked in ministry mm. and having been a speaker, like going, Hey, we, we totally want to respect that you have a limited budget here, but let me just tell you on this end, this is the, the kind of prep that goes into a talk. And this is how much time they'll be away from their family. And this is why we put that value on what they take away mm -hmm. from their family and their office job. Yeah. They have an office job that's taking them away from a project. And so I love being able to help a host that may not understand that, understand that, but you're right. When a host does understand that and even acknowledges it, it just, God, I'm sure it just fills you up. It yeah. does. And it's like, and it makes me think like I could do, like, I love doing this because I love the way um, that they understand it. Okay. So more than likely someone's listening and they're like, oh, I want her to represent me. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> what do, do you guys take? How do you guys take on client? I take on, they're not your clients. They would be your people. What would you call them? Your speakers. Yeah, so there are, yeah, there are community of communicators. I love it. Your communicators. Like yeah. <laughs> um, and so we s- launched with about 20 speakers. And when we did, we were totally honored, but surprised by the flood of people I'm that sure. we got wanting to join the agency, which is is so honoring. And we are so excited. I mean, we're literally going through emails and um, following up on these connections. And we're just like, we're like, oh my goodness, we want to bring all these people on. What we're trying to do since we are a startup and we've just gotten going is that we don't want to neglect our current speakers Mm -hmm. that we have. So right now, what we're going to try to do is bring on about two speakers a month. um, And we're just in the vetting process, if you will. So when someone uh, contacts us through our our website, punchlinespeakers.com, there's a contact page. And a lot of people are contacting us through there of saying, hey, I'm interested. Are you bringing people on? The answer is yes. This is what we follow up with. So if you want to jump one step. Uh-huh. So yes, we are. Send us clips of you speaking that would best represent yourself and what you're wanting to pursue more and anything else that would be helpful um, in us getting to know you as a speaker. And so then we work as a team to kind of go, okay, what's the direction we're heading and who might we want to bring on? So yes. Yes. Long story short, yes. Send your stuff in. <laughs> Good. Because yes. I know people are listening and, you know, a lot of a lot of communicators listen and they're like, I desire to do that more. And so yeah. now they have well, a place to send it. And the, and one of the things that we're doing in the interim that we hope will help um, is for people who maybe we can't bring you on tomorrow, even though we wish we could just <laughs> do that. Um, we have services. So between the three of us agents, we've all been in the conference world for several years. And so we have services like if maybe you're someone who's saying, I want to be a speaker. I think I have this thing inside of me and I want to learn how to present it on stage better. Um, we can we can help you with that. Or even if you're going, I don't need to be on stage, but I have a presentation at my office that I have to mm-hmm. give. Or we have one agent who helps with content and book launches and someone who's done podcasting and can help with that. So there are extra things, even if you're not necessarily interested or ready uh, for a speaking agency. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Good stuff to know. So yeah. this will work well for your job because you can do it anywhere. You're leaving the country. Yes, I know. <laughs> People are like, wait, wait, wait. So your office is in Paris. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Which tell me this, this is something you really had to think about. I'm sure you have. So Mm -hmm. when will you be working? Because, I mean, I guess email translates whenever, obviously. Yeah. Have you, what is that going to look like for you? Yeah. So the, I have office hours and I think it's actually going to really, because I did, I definitely got some, um, uh, professional career assessment and guidance and coaching and people, the feedback that I got was like, yes, you, you can make this work. What I found with the bookings that I've done for my dad the last couple of years is 95% of it is done through email. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the customer service side of things is what the two other agents, Aaron and Ashley. So anything, anything negotiation related, like fact finding, um, contract related is on me. I'm the kind of the first step. And then after the contract is signed and, you know, the communication between the speaker and the host and then the technical support, the week of and travel and all that, that's Aaron and Ashley will be handling that. So it, it works out well, but then I also will be working in Paris. Um, like the, when my day ends is coming to a close, those last few hours is when I will be in the work day of the East Coast and West Coast time. So there is overlap and that's oh, when I'll be yeah. available for phone calls or Skype meetings or consultations or whatever. So Perfect. I, yes, I have worked it all out. <laughs> hey guys, before we get back to finishing my talk with Joy, which I know that you're loving as much as I did, I want to thank another one of our partners for this show and that is Prep Dish. Prep Dish is out to make our lives easier by creating a great meal plan for us to save time Um, and spend less and spend more time with our families every week. And so the way Prep Dish works is that when you join Prep Dish every week, you are emailed a menu and a grocery list and directions for prepping your meals. So you take your grocery list, you go shopping, you come home and you spend two to three hours preparing the meals for the entire week. And then you put them in the fridge and then every single day there's instructions on how to prep that meal. What's gonna happen guys is you're gonna spend less time in the kitchen and more time with your friends and family and you're gonna create great meals for your family. Um, There's paleo, gluten-free, different options that you can choose from, and right now, Prep Dish is offering the Happy Hour listeners a $4 trial, which means for $1 a week, you're gonna have someone create a grocery list for you, 
preparation instructions, and meal instructions. You just can't beat it. Go to prepdish.com slash happy hour, all lowercase to get this deal. All right, here is the rest of my conversation with Joy. Okay, Paris, I've never been, but I hear it's lovely and you are about to live there. What is taking you guys to Paris? So, um, when I was dating my husband, uh, he works for a renewable energy kind of, uh, investment type company. And, um, I found out that it was a company that's owned by a French company. And I said, I will marry you if you get us to Paris someday. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why we're married. There you go. And, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, his job. Uh, there was an opening in the company that owned his company. And so we are moving there for two to three years. And I'm so excited. You really should go. It's not when I first visited Paris, I was like, okay, this is going to be overrated. The Eiffel Tower. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Croissants. Nope. It's not. It's everything it is. Everything that people say it is and more. Right. Yeah. 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 It's really charming. And it's, you know, there's this misconception that French people are rude or stuck up. And we, Matt and I have been learning a lot about the culture. And um, there's just there's cultural differences that lead us to assume that they're snobby. But one of the really interesting things is from a very little age, the kids are taught to say bonjour to everyone. Mm-hmm. And bonjour is not only a greeting, but it's also a, hey, I'm in your space. So like, we have the customer service mentality in America where we walk in and the people working in that store are there to serve us, you know? Yeah. Whereas in France, it's like, they, this is the store, they own the store, they own the space. We go in and acknowledge that they might be busy. Like bonjour is like, I know you might be busy. I'm just saying hello and that I'm here. Right. And so it's more of the, we approach, we approach them if we need help because for them to approach us in their mentality is, is rude because then they're like getting in our space. And we in America are like, oh, they're rude. They don't approach us. Exactly. But it's just how they do it. Yeah. And if we walk into a, a space and we don't say bonjour, that scene is really rude as well. Mm. So, so it, h- how's your language? <laughs> bonjour. <that's, laughs> you got something. That's, I can say bonjour, croissant, and Eiffel Tower. And that's about <laughs> it. Um, no, my husband speaks the language and I am going to, I was going to start taking classes here, but I got to a point where I said, for the sake of our marriage and my sanity, um, which I might, I might need your counseling on my, I'm feeling high levels of anxiety right now. (laughs) I said, for the, for the sake of our marriage and my sanity, like I need to focus on launching this company, Mm. getting us packed up and moved saying goodbye to our friends and, you know, whatever else, but I cannot start learning a language. Like, I'm just not, are you bent towards languages? No, that's what I was going to say. I'm not bent towards. And so for me, I think the only way that I could learn like fluently, not just like, you know, hola, como estas, you know, Spanish (laughs) over here is to be immersed. And so you're about to do that. And so I would think that it's going to come more naturally and be almost a higher need as well. Like, honestly, if you had a class today, but you had so much to do, you don't need that language today. Yeah. You know, yeah, exactly. so yeah, exactly. I think yeah. you're, you're and doing the right thing. Yeah. We went over in November just to visit and look at neighborhoods that we wanted to live in. And um, Matt, but Matt actually had to work that week. And so I worked in the morning and then the afternoons, I went and explored all the different neighborhoods. And I was, I took the Metro and which is like their subway system. And I was um, in the, in the Metro and then it came to a stop and they were like saying all these things and people were kind of like looking around and they like some people were getting off. And I just felt so I was like, I have no idea what's going on. Like, is that, you know, so I just been sitting there and finally more and more people got off and this like security person come on and just looked at me. I was like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and I was like, OK. And I just mass exited. I was like, I broke the Metro my first time on the Metro. Oh, and I break the done. Metro. That, yeah. I, that is a weird feeling, and especially because you were all by yourself. Like, to me, it'd be like one thing if my husband or your husband was there and you're like, okay, we have each other, we're a team, like lost yeah. in the sea. Um, yeah. <laughs> but that feeling of not understanding anything, that yeah. makes my stomach hurt right now thinking about it, Joy. This is, this yeah, is about to be you your world. Cause you, and you can't, you know, I'm not, I have no qualms in a normal situation to like tap someone on the shoulder in a <laughs> yeah. public space and be like, Hey, do you understand what's going on or what should we do right. here? But it's like, no, I can't do that. So it gives me a deep, 
deep respect for people who come to America and don't mm, know the language. Yeah. And I'm finding even with a little bit of French that I'm starting to um, learn about, I'm realizing how complicated English is and how many whack rules we yep. have and then rules that get broken. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and rules that we don't even all know, but we just exactly. use them or don't use them. It's crazy. Um, yeah. But we have little chants in our head like I before E except after C. Like that's that's. <laughs> <laughs> That's the rule that goes to my head all the time when I'm writing. Did I say exactly. that right? I, I I think so. I don't even know. And that's the thing I told Matt. I was like, I was Except like, how am C? I supposed to learn a language if I don't even know English grammar? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> oh, good. yeah, it's I before I before E, except after C, or as in what, or as in way, as in neighbor, no, or C? as something as in neighbor and way. Oh, neighbor. Yeah. This is crazy. Wow, somebody, somebody's going to tweet somebody's you. Somebody's going to help right? us out with this. Some <laughs> English teacher is listening. It's actually like a first grade teacher because that's where we learn all these things. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so moving to Paris, do you guys have a place to stay there? Like you're set, you're good? Yes, and that was kind of a crazy uh, experience too. It was like we had, his company had somebody that was helping us look and we had a neighborhood that we wanted to be in. And another really interesting thing that we're learning about French bureaucracy and the way they do things is that when you write and ask questions, so like if I was working with you and I wrote you, I said, hey, Jamie, we're really interested in this neighborhood and we, um, here's a couple links that we found of apartments that look cool and can you answer X, Y, Z? If you wrote back and you didn't have information right away on that, what would you what what would you write back and say? This looks great. I don't know everything. I'll get back with you. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> so the French culture we're learning, and again, this is just from my limited experience. So again, I don't want people being like, this isn't how they right, are. This right. is what we found. And we're hearing from more and more people this is true that they don't respond until they have an answer. Oh, so you're waiting. So, you're waiting and you're kind of like, did you get my email? Uh -huh. <laughs> and then when they do respond, they only respond with like positive answers. So like if that, if that link that I sent, the apartment was not available, they just won't even talk about that. They won't say this wasn't available. They'll just be like, here's three other apartments to look at. And you're like, but wait, what, what about, about the any? one? <laughs> yeah. They don't give you information if they don't think that it's necessary in moving forward. So that's just been a really like interesting thing to learn yeah. because it's, you know, it's almost effective. Like I think about how many emails we have going back and forth in America. Whereas like if everybody had the mindset of like, we're not going to write just a simple thank you email. Cause those, that just adds another email of right. like, thanks uh -huh. on it or I'll get back <laughs> to you. Like all those extra, just like little tidbits of like, I'll let you know when I find out. It like helps us put things at peace, but yeah. it's also just adding a ton to our workday. It's another ding. Well, so, we have to all be on the same space so that I would know if Joy's not emailing me back, it's because she's still working on it. Exactly. So that's where it's like, I don't think that could ever, that could ever be a shift that happens, but I'm actually kind of looking forward to it in a weird way if I can get used to it in France. Now, are you, go you're going to, this is what happens though. You're going to adapt so much to the culture that you're going to quit emailing people back and they're gonna be like, Joy, did you not give me an email? And you're like, I'm still working on it. I'll email you when I have all the answers. I'm French. This is what <laughs> this I is do. This is what we do. Don't you know? <laughs> I'm busy eating my croissants. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, that I am so excited. That is a place that we want to visit. We almost tacked it onto a trip that we were gone overseas uh, this year and didn't, but it is higher on my list. Last question about uh, Paris. Yeah. Have you been there in, in summer and winter? No, visit? I've been there in winter, okay. so I think I only have like the good to look forward to Paris yeah. in the springtime, right? Right. Yeah. 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 And you're moving like March 3rd or something? Yes. Literally, yep. as people are listening <laughs> to this podcast, you're on an airplane. I am. I am. And I and I feel like I know you've had like a lot of different things happen in your life and I and you've written about anxiety, right? Uh-huh. So I have this problem right now where I have been so determined to stay positive about everything because I'm like, these are all good things. I wanted to move to Paris. I wanted to start a company. I wanted to learn a language. I wanted to rent out our home. I wanted to do all these different things and rent out our home to friends, uh -huh. by the way. Yeah. And, 
And I'm, so I'm like, I'm not going to be one of those people who says I'm stressed because I feel right. like when people are like, Oh, I'm so stressed. I'm so stressed. I have so much going on. It's like, we all have things going right. on, you know? <laughs> and these are all really, really good things. I'm happy about everything that you want, like things on your bucket list. Here we go. Totally. Yeah. Totally. So then if you have the mindset of like, I'm not stressed, these are gifts from the Lord. Like these are things that I've chosen. Then tell me, Jamie, why I wake up every morning having, I have terrible stress dreams. My shoulder and neck are in constant knots. I can't, for weeks now, I can't like get the pain to go away. And I don't, and I'm like, I obviously am stressed, even though I've been determined not to be, and I'm feeling anxious and I don't want to be. So what do I do? Do you have an animal? (laughs) I don't. That would be another thing, Jamie. No, let me tell you, Joy. (laughs) When my stress levels are high, I take my dog and I go outside (laughs) and my dog and my cat play and I watch them and all of my worries go away because they just play and literally it does something to my brain. I think it might be scientific. Yeah. No, actually I think serotonin is released when I watch my animals play. They bring puppies to, um, to old folks homes and that brings the blood pressure down. See, you just, no, I've heard that there are places like, brick and mortar shops where you go in and you can cuddle with animals and leave. <gasps> yes, there is. There's a place, there's a place in Portland. Okay. I might've heard about this on the relevant podcast, by the way. Yes. Yes. I, that's what I was just going to say. That's where I brought it up. It's, yes. it's, it's all cats. It's cats. See, Joy, you brought this up one time. I heard it and now I'm giving it back to you. Full circle, full circle. Well, and also my neighbors have a dog, so maybe I can just ask them if I can take their dog for a while. Just take the dog uh, for a walk, get outside, and then everything changes. Here's my other tip for you. Um, okay. I just started swimming, oh. and um, it's the only place I can go where my brain stops working because I'm only thinking about not dying. So, <laughs> all- just constant egg beaters and doggy paddle. <laughs> constant. I'm just like, I'm doing, I only know one stroke, the regular one. And I, all I'm doing is I'm counting to three and then I'm breathing and I have one mission and it's not to die. So maybe you need to find some kind of outlet that is so difficult for you that your brain stops and you only think about not dying. Well, okay. A couple thoughts to that. One, I feel like I can't really work out well unless I have music. And I've that's, heard see, from that's people, hard. Yeah. You can have you can have underwater earbuds, but that feels complicated and like <laughs> shock waiting and, like, to happen. Like dangerous, right? Yeah. And then the, the second thing is I was on the Golden Serpent Swim Club when I was uh, in elementary. Look at you. Yeah. But I had this. You're, you're like, okay, <laughs> this is where the anxiety stems from. I had this thing in my head where I like my imagination would go crazy and I pretended or not, didn't pretend, but I believed that what if a crazy scientist had developed invisible sharks. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. And they were in the water with me. And so swimming was just, a, it it's, was just, it's that's a why pool I of swam anxiety. fast at all. Yes. <laughs> You're so just like anxious. I know. Oh, oh that is goodness. stressful. I used to be scared when my, when I was younger, my grandma had a pool. She lived in California and I would kind of like be scared of sharks too. And then I would snap out of it and realize that I'm in her backyard in San Diego and there's no sharks. Like I get it. Yeah. You're not yeah, alone here. You. Thank so, you. <laughs> so my three advice, you know, like, you know, pray, that's number one, and then play with puppies and kitties and then swim for your life. <laughs> that's my <laughs> that's my anxiety. And that's when the advice. anxiety comes back up for me. Like, but, oh, yes. that's so bad. Yes, yes. There's no sharks, but it's good. That's <laughs> why I'm, we went um scuba di- like scuba diving and that's where the thing sticks out, right? It's not where you're yeah, underwater. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, scuba no, no, snork that's okay, snorkeling. so snorkeling. We were snorkeling um in the Virgin Islands and I have never been so anxious in water in my entire life. We got, you know, you have to swim out from the boat so you can get to where all the pretty stuff is underwater. And I just started hyperventilating. I couldn't do it. I was <laughs> determined there was a shark. And then I had to swim back to the boat all by myself. And when you look down, it's just dark. It's black. Yeah. Oh, that is not. Yeah. I did it one time in Hawaii and I, A, will never do it again because it was too scary to me, just like you were feeling. I hated and it. And B, I don't know about you, but I actually don't think I can do Hawaii anymore either. <laughs> I've never been, but it's the farthest. Mm-hmm. And again, someone might correct us if we're wrong, but I believe it's the farthest like I, I, land mass away from other land. It's and stressful. So, 
What are you going to do was, if, if tragedy hits? I mean, exactly. Right. I was there for a few days and one of, I said, I said to one of my friends, we were laying in the hammock, which what can you do? That's more relaxing than that. <laughs> and I was like, it was like day three. And I was like, man, I just don't feel, I don't feel relaxed here. And she was like, oh, you probably have Island fever. And I was like, what's this is several years ago. I was like, what's Island fever. And then she explained it to me, which you know what that is, right? It's just this like fear of not being able to get off this the island and i was like that's exactly what i'm feeling <laughs> and it just feels like everything's closing in on you so as i'm saying all this maybe i'm just an anxious person see maybe or maybe you have what my husband says i have and he calls it i gotta write it down so i can say it right <laughs> wcsd worst case scenario disease <laughs> <laughs> he has diagnosed me with wcsd it's very it's 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 highly common and very undiagnosed. So well, tell your tell your husband <laughs> I might have that too, but maybe it's just that you and I are prepared. <laughs> That's exactly. I always say, "Hey, safety is no accident." I need to know what's happening around <laughs> me, so I am always prepared for the worst. I'm prepared in a movie theater in case someone comes in acting crazy. I know where I'm going to yeah, go. Exactly. And he and says it's dumb. Do you know that I do that same thing in church on Sundays? <gasps> I always want to sit on the aisle as if I'm going to like protect everyone in the church should something happen. And same thing with airplanes. Do you ever sit on an airplane and think, what do I have around me that I could use to defend if something happens? <gasps> I haven't thought on an airplane, but I will from now on. But I'm with you with the church thing. We have a police officer at the front of our church. And if oh, wow. he acts weird in one way, I, I know we're all going down. Like literally <laughs> one time he was talking into his little ear thing. And I thought, yeah. this is it. Like we're done. <laughs> And then I asked him later, I was like, hey, Officer Barnes, was everything okay? He's like, yeah, I was just telling him there were some seats up front here if anyone needed them. And I was like, <laughs> I literally was dead in my brain already. And my husband on stage, too. Like, I just knew I was going to watch the whole thing go down. <laughs> and he was just like telling them there are seats up front if anyone needs them. I love it. So, love it. okay, I'm glad we have that in common. Okay, let's get to what you love in these days. What are three things you're loving this these days, Joy? Besides croissants oh. and Eiffel Towers. Or yeah, just one okay. Eiffel Tower, but. Hmm. Three things I'm loving. I am loving um, being a plant mother. Um, Matt and I hope to have children at some point, but I always thought that I couldn't keep plants alive. And as I'm literally sitting here in a room surrounded by plants and in our bedroom, it's getting a little out of control. I have all these plants that I've made from like, have you ever done a plant start? No, you no, you're a starter. Yeah. I can tell. Look at you. <laughs> if you cut off, like if you have a plant, it's got, you know, the hanging, whatever uh -huh. things, and you cut one off and then put it in water be between like four and six weeks later, it'll have roots and then you can replant it. And so my house is now full of plants that I have made from other plants. And I'm, I'm just, I really, it makes me really happy. You know, I heard <laughs> that they, plants are really good to have in your home because of the oxygen they release. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Which is that that's like my game plan for our Paris apartment because our Paris apartment is the same cost as our mortgage on our home. That's and it's lovely. about <laughs> a fourth of the size. Right. Um, yeah. So I'm planning on getting a lot and that'll be my office as well. So I'm plant city for, plant for city. my health. Yes, my health. of course. Okay. So you're loving plants and recreating them. You're like scientist joy over there. Yes. Um, what else am I loving? I really do love being married and I, I feel like... I was single for, you know, until I was 30, almost 34. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I loved my single life too. Um, but I really, really love being married. It's just so nice to have like a buddy there mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. Um, so, and that was kind of, I was always, I was kind of wishy-washy when I was dating my husband, um, of like, is this right? Is this not, you know, because that's just the way my brain works. Um, but I remember one time my mom saying like, do you ever get sick of being around him or not want to be around him? And I was like, no, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe we're still on the honeymoon stage, but, and we definitely fight. Don't get me wrong. Right. Um, but we just fought, uh, we actually fought really late on February 13th. Uh -huh. Um, so it like turned to Valentine's <laughs> day and we we're like, great first married Valentine's day. <laughs> That's always the best when it goes over yeah. to the next day, you know, yeah. through the yeah. night. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I love marriage is one of my, like, I always say it's one of God's greatest things that he gave me as well, because I just love having that buddy. And Aaron's always like, would you love being married to anyone or is it me? And I was like, <laughs> well, it's you a lot, but I also do really value the like partner, you know, like someone's always with you. So it's fun.
Okay. Yeah. What else? Which I've always, I always kind of operated that way anyways. Like I love, I have great friends, but I always kind of loved having one buddy, Mm -hmm. one best friend, because it's, I don't love getting together with friends where we have to do this whole big, long catch up thing. I love someone that I can kind of be with on the day in and day out so that we can just like exist or create or dream together and not have to be like, yeah. And then last week I did, you Uh know, so that's why I love being married. Um, last thing that I love, Ooh, I feel like it's gotta be a good one. Um, 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 I really love, uh, I love like decorating homes. I didn't realize that I would like that so much. And so I, this last year as we decorated our house, I loved, and when I say decorate, it's not about just like buying things. I'm very thrifty mm-hmm. Tuesday more the, the women at Tuesday morning. Do you guys have Tuesday morning? <laughs> I know what it is. Yes. Oh yeah. They like no. Yes. Um, and so now it's like, I've had so much fun making our house into a home and making it cozy. And now I'm like, Oh, I get to do it again. And do Paris. it all over again <laughs> in a much yeah. smaller space with baby yeah. plants. Exactly, um, exactly. I love that. I love that. Okay. What are you reading these days? What are we reading? I'm reading bringing up Bay Bay. Uh, have you heard of that book? No. It's, um, it was quite popular, I think for four years ago or something. And it's about an American woman who married a British guy and then they lived in Paris and um, talking about her observations of raising kids and how the French do it differently than Americans and the pros and cons, but everything that she learned from French mothers. And Matt actually read it first and he was like, this is phenomenal. You have to read this. And so now I'm reading it. Is it phenomenal? Do you love it? Yes, it's really, she's a really funny, engaging writer, uh-huh. but she has incredible insights. She had, I think she had, my dad, because my dad has written a parenting book as well, and I think he even quoted her in his book, because she, she's a journalist. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like, it, it's, it's researched based in the sense of like, she did her own research, but then she just really like talked to so many moms in France. And um, so it's like, it's research based in that like very practical way of like, I was sitting at a park. Yeah, these right. Women. I know it's this. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I really liked it. Oh, well, good. Or like it, yeah. I love that. I am hardly reading anything these days, but um, I always love hearing what other people are reading. And yeah, I, should, I, should inc- I should include People Magazine as well. <laughs> I somehow got, I got that subscription with like free, did you ever get the like Miles thing? Oh, no, but I yeah. used to get a subscription to People and loved it's- it. It's such a guilty pleasure. So I, I'm so happy that I do have a book to say that's right by my bed. Right. But for the most part, <laughs> People Magazine is my go-to. <laughs> Would you say People Magazine is a pretty trusted resource for what's actually happening? Oh, no. Okay. No, 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 no. No, I really, I love, um, I love looking at like the outfits and I do, I'm just intrigued by, like they have a, they have a, a quote section. Mm-hmm. Like what that's, people I are like saying. that too. It's funny sometimes. Yeah. Cause that, that's gotta obviously be really sad, yeah. but I, I find humanity so intriguing. And I know that there's I, I, what I never believe is when they're like, like I just read an article about Prince Harry and he's dating that he's uh-huh, dating that the, Canadian yeah. actress uh-huh, from suits. Yeah. suits yep. Yeah. And, uh, and it's like a source close to Harry says, she's really sweet. And uh. They're really happy. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> that's source. a made up quote. Yeah. You meet a <laughs> rando person like across the street that saw them walking and Yeah. Oh my gosh. Can you even imagine if that was your life and like they're writing about you and then they say a close source and you're like, that's so not true. First of all, none of my friends would say that. And it's just false. I would hate to live that life. I'm just saying, Oh, yeah. so you wouldn't want to be married to a Roy. Like if your husband was royalty, uh, actually I would, <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it actually. Yeah. Cause you and know, you want- Oh, go ahead. Well, I always ask, I asked this last night at our dinner, at, we had people over for dinner. I always ask this question to get to know people, okay? I'm going to ask you, ready? Would you rather be rich or famous? Ooh, infamous? <laughs> <laughs> nope. Um, rich or famous? I, ooh, that's hard. And the thing is, there's no right or wrong say? answer. It's not like, oh, if you want to be rich, you're like love money and hate people. And if you want to be famous, you know what I mean? You don't care about anything. It's just, I think it's a brilliant question to just get to like, what is driving someone? And it's it's not necessarily money drives it, but usually people that choose money are like, I don't want anyone to know me, you know? Yes. And so yep. for me, yep. I always have always chose famous. Um, yeah. But it's not because I want to be married to Prince Harry or, or on the cover of People. But I just like that feeling of being known. Does that make sense? Yeah. But it's not a bad thing. And being rich yeah. isn't. Yeah. So it's just interesting. What do you think you would say? 
That's what I'm trying to think because I can I go through the pros and cons because I feel like I've always said I I enjoy making money, mm -hmm. but I'm not driven by like uh -huh. I like to have it to you know feel safe like I think all we do. But I, I I've said being really massively rich feels like too much of a weight mm -hmm. like. You're, it, it's a full-time job to be rich mm -hmm. because it's like people are hitting you up for right. money and you have to know what to do with it and you want to be wise with it. So on some level, it's like, oh, it'd be really fun. We could be generous and all that. And there would be no, you know, quote unquote cares. But I feel like rich people have so many things to maintain uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> because of their wealth. So then on that side, I'm like, oh, I want to be famous. But then it's like, okay, but what kind of famous it's and how invasive are people on your life? And do you ever get away? And, you know, so I, I would think that you would pick famous though. Because you, like, extrovert, which doesn't actually equal that, but you seem as though someone who enjoys talking to people and being, that that doesn't even make sense either what I'm saying. I don't know. What would you pick? Oh, I have to pick. Well, see, I'm not as, I'm quite a homebody. I'm not, I really do love people. I'm intrigued by humanity, but I, I do spend quite a bit of time alone. Mm -hmm. Like, even my husband last night was like, He's like, I we've got to get out of the house. I'm like, I could stay here for days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's a, it is. I don't. I. Oh man, maybe you can't. Um, you can't pick. You have to choose. I have to. You choose. have to choose right now. It doesn't. It doesn't mean anything. Just what are you thinking? Oh. <laughs> I, I have never asked someone this question, and it has been so hard for them. This is intriguing. Yeah. I really, because there's part of me, like, I think there's been seasons in my life where I'm like, oh man, to be the lead singer of a band would be so fun. But then I can literally go down the trail of like people saying that doesn't make you like, I feel like both of those scenarios, they both have here's awful my trait. They all both have awful things attached to them. Yes, right. That, yeah. So, so I think my answer is, this is going to sound like really uh, brown nosing, but like it it depends on my character. And so then thinking through my character, I would say, maybe I would say famous because <laughs> I could still find ways with fame to make money. <laughs> so you did it. You went all the way down and that's where you yeah. ended up. Yeah. What did you pick? Oh, you picked me. I've famous. always picked famous um, because I always, it's like deep in me to be known. Like, and that has led to a lot of like, we don't have time for this, but it's led to a lot of like awful sin patterns in my young life you know, yeah. that desire to be known and to be loved. Um, yeah. And so that's where that comes from for me. I too don't want to be like the lead singer of any band for the number one reason I don't know how to sing. But, you know, so <laughs> there's that. But I think it comes from this inward, like, I've just always wanted to be known. And I feel that with bad areas. And I feel that with Jesus now, hopefully every single day. But, you know, there's like that inward thing inside of me. That's where mine comes yeah. from. Yeah. What do you find that most people say? Is there a majority? It's funny. Or is it so 50 -50? we had so we had six people at our dinner table last night, including Aaron and myself. And the both of the other two couples both said money, and Aaron and I both said fame. Huh? Isn't that funny? Yeah. And one of the guys at our table is, <clears throat> I would call him, he's famous in his own sense for sure, right here in Austin, Texas. Um, and he he did not say fame, um, but I think he's also lived that. And has seen like the hard parts about that, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, I've never lived that. So to me, it's like, oh, this will be fun, you know. But yeah, there's hard stuff with it. So, wow. Well, I, I look forward to getting my People magazine with you on the cover. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to go out and go on a limb and say that will not ever happen. So <laughs> there's that. I'm so glad you're the first guest I think I've ever asked my most favorite question to ask at a dinner party. Oh, I love, I feel like you should ask every interview you do because it, it really. I mean, maybe they won't go into a downward spiral like <laughs> I did. But <laughs> And you're also my first guest that has ever imagined sharks in her pool at the YMCA. Uh, I hope if, if anybody listening also has that fear, please make me feel less. Oh, alone. <laughs> this is the best joy. It was so fun to talk with you. And I wish you guys the best in Paris. And Thank I'm you. excited for your new venture with your speaking agency. Um, what a fun job to have and just all that God has in front of you. So thanks for joining me today on the happy hour. Thank you. I was honored to be on. Guys, I told you it was fun, right? Joy is so much fun. I loved hearing her squirm at the end. That would you rather question. The question is odd and I hesitated leaving it in this show because it can come across really weird when you don't have context of a person and someone that loves you and all those kind of things. Because It's a weird question. Would you rather be rich or famous? Both of them have 
horrible things attached to them. Um, and both of them have great things attached to them. It's just interesting as for me as a person to hear what people say. It kind of gives us this little, little bit of glimpse into their personality. Um, and I explained to you where mine comes from with that just desire to be known, which I think a lot of us have. Um, and funny, I have a whole chapter in my book about this. So that's super exciting. Um, and I loved hearing her answer it. I loved her thoughts on her speaking agency, and I just cannot wait to follow her journey throughout France. Guys, today's show was edited by Logan Garza, and the music is from Jason Poe. Next week, my guest is Heather Avis. Guys, enjoy your week. Share the show with a girlfriend and have a happy hour with a friend. I'll see you guys next week.